Hey, Paul, I'm excited to tell you that we are launching a Curbsiders Patreon. Have you heard about this? I I did because I work with you, but tell me more about it. (laughs) All right, Paul. Well, we want to be able to keep offering this great free content, and we're doing things like upgrading our website. We offer transcripts now for episodes, recording new seasons of our miniseries, Teach and Addiction Medicine. The Digest is growing its staff. And Paul, now we're on video. People can see us uh, as we're talking right here. What a treat for our listeners. That's right. So with Cashlack admitting privileges, they're going to get all episodes ad-free. That's the whole back catalog, plus future episodes. And twice monthly, there's going to be bonus episodes where me and you recap a show and answer some listener questions. So people should sign up today at patreon.com slash curbsiders. And uh, you get a whole lot more of Paul, America's PCP. (laughs) First one that came up. This is from 11 11 hilarious arthritis puns. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul, apparently there is bipartisan agreement in Congress for medical cannabis uh, that it should be allowed for the purpose of relieving relieving arthritis pain. You know why? Tell me why. In in other words, Paul, there is joint support for joint support Uh, for joint support. uh, That's that's terrific. That's a, okay. Yeah. Good. There we go. All right. The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect the official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. All right, Paul, welcome back to the Curbsiders. Uh, In person here, ACP Internal Medicine 2023. This will, of course, be released after the fact. But, uh, Paul, today we're talking about wisely ordering autoantibodies. Certainly a topic that I could could have used, and now I feel... feel I feel empowered. How about you? I I feel much better about being more restrictive about my ordering. I don't... There'll still be the errant ANA that I don't know what to do with, but I I feel like I'm going to do better after this episode. And our guest, Dr. Matthew Carroll, will tell you a bit about him in a second. But Paul, what is it that we do on Curbsiders? Thank you for asking. We are the internal medicine podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And Matt, you're about to tell us about our excellent guest and a little bit about what we talked about. That's right. So Dr. Carroll uh, is a rheumatologist. He went to Uniform Services University. He worked as a medical officer and leader in the United States Air Force. He serves tours of duty in South Korea, United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia, Colorado, Kuwait, and Oman. In 2007, he completed his rheumatology fellowship and relocated to Keesler Medical Center in Mississippi. There, he was a dedicated leader helping restore a residency shuttered by Hurricane Katrina. He served as associate program director of their internal medicine residency, guiding the program to meet the next accreditation standards. He initiated multiple clinical trials, led the IRB, and served as the designated institutional officer, the DIO. Upon retirement in 2017 from the military, he's working in Singing River Health System. He has been an ACP member since 1996, Paul, uh, active in the Air Force chapter. He's been uh, part of the Board of Governors from 2002 to 2005. He's won a Chapter Laureate Award in 2021, and he served as the Air Force ACP Chapter Governor from 2017 to 2021 and received the honor of Master American College of Physicians in 2022. So needless to say, we are thrilled to have such a great guest on this episode. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for CME credit for all health professionals through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. And with that, let's get on to the interview. Audience, uh, this is going to be our take two because uh, I forgot to press record, so we'll, we'll do it again. Okay, uh, <laughs> Matt, thank you for answering this question twice in a row. So, <laughs> welcome to the Curbsiders, and uh, give the audience a hobby or interest that you have outside of medicine. So, I w- I like to garden. I, I think that's kind of fun. It's a nice way to kind of relieve stress. And uh, living in South Mississippi, it's kind of easy to almost get two seasons growing. I don't usually do successful in the fall, but I'll get some tomatoes and other uh, veggies before the bugs get them. Um, and then I like to run, so I think running is just a good way to 
offload stress and stay cardiovascularly fit and try to keep the cardiologist hungry. Hopefully they won't be stenting <laughs> me at any point soon. And then my wife is, uh, you know, certainly my better half. She keeps us busy. We've got young kids and we're running around taking care of them. And so I try to do, uh, I'm a mad scientist for my, my kids. They're in uh, middle school and uh, well, really upper elementary. So I just, I was a chemist. That was my bachelor's. Oh, nice. mm -hmm. I dress up with white hair and a lab coat and we just do cool experiments and the kids like that too. So a little bit of everything. You just trying to stay YouTube physically active. channel with this. <laughs> I, I thought about it. It just, I'm not as tech savvy. My wife's a lot smarter. She yeah. tried and we almost did that with the pandemic, but uh, I just try to like stay busy in certain activities and areas because I think as we all know, as the kids grow up faster and life goes on, it's just, there's so much going on. Yeah. This touches on two things that Nat and I have talked about and that the people who garden seem to be much better adjusted than people who don't. <laughs> and then also we were talking earlier about how running is more to prevent psych psychopathy than it is to actually make you feel good. Like, I don't know if like for me, it just keeps me dreaming lately homicidal. And yeah, I, it's, amen. it is it's stressful. And then, yeah, at least for, for me, gardening, it's, you're gonna be thinner. Yeah. Sorry. Gardening. I still, Paul, I'm audience. Eventually I will start a garden, Paul. Same. I, I think, I, I I think it's in your first. near future. Yeah, sure. I think a yard <laughs> is in your near future, Paul, <laughs> yeah. with this upcoming move. Sure, awesome. I think, I think a garden's in your future. So, Paul, do you want to ask anything? Sure. And then I, you, you were giving us some excellent advice before we um, started recording. So now that we have actually started recording, uh, I would love to hear that advice um, to its completion. Yeah. Well, first of all, again, thank you for having me here. It's really an honor to be on podcasters and to just kind of hopefully provide a very informative session for all of us here, but certainly more importantly for the listening and viewing audience. Uh, I, I joked about earlier, patients and and other docs will come to me sometimes and say, what what wisdom do you have? What advice do you have? And I, and I always kind of jokingly say, but it's partially true, is the gray hairs are getting deeper. It seems like, you know, we're going from a 64K down to a 32K down to a smaller and smaller, <laughs> you know, memory. But the reality is, I think the takeaway is we are under a tremendous amount of stress every day as we see our patients with regard to trying to be productive for RVUs and get that next patient in and just move people through. And, and that really, I think, drives us further and further from the essence of medicine, which is providing really a global, more holistic care for our patients. And I've really been focusing on the past five or 10 years, and maybe if not a little bit longer, on the service aspect of it. I think in medicine, we're here to serve. We're here to give back to our community and build and nurture, especially in some of the turbulent times that we've seen. So I think just taking the time to know your patient, go that extra mile for your patient, not always easy. I mean, I, I certainly stumble on that journey, but it's yeah. a blessing to be able to take that one extra step and maybe get that medicine for a discount because you took the five minutes or your nurse took the five minutes to get them the medication card for the discount or we're arranging for transportation or something like that, which can be a real, you know, it's, it takes some time. It takes valuable time from all your, you and your, all your staff. I, th I think probably one of the best headspace adjustments I've made in my entire career is recognizing that the goal is to get patients towards a shared health goal as opposed to getting them to do the thing that I want them to do. And once you yeah. even make that adjustment, yes. life becomes so much better. Um, yeah, early on yes. I used to take it personally if the patient <laughs> yes. didn't do the things that I was trying right. to arrange for them. And then I was like, oh yeah, that's because they didn't want to do them. <laughs> right. I should probably find out what they want. And then if we're working together, it'll it'll, it'll work better and I will be less frustrated with things. Yeah. Or sometimes afford them. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, I think I think we're in a good spot, Paul, to just jump into a case from Cashlack. Paul, would you do the honors of reading it just because I think everyone loves to hear from sure. America's PCP. Yeah, yeah. My soothing baritone. We're going to talk about Jocelyn, who is a 44-year-old female. She has a history significant for chronic low back pain, migraine headaches, pure hypercholesterolemia, parentheses, mild, uh, a BMI of 29. She's coming to our primary care office for an initial visit. She's reporting joint pain in her knees and her hands. The pain has been present on and off for years, but it has gotten progressively worse over the past six months. She has stiffness in her knees and hands upon awakening. She works in an Amazon warehouse packing and stacking boxes. She states her energy level could be better, um, as is true for all of us. Her grandmother and her aunt have arthritis, but she's not sure what type, uh, whether or not to take any medications for it. And so we have a picture here that I feel like comes up all the time in primary care where is this an inflammatory arthritis? Because she has some of the things. Is this simple arthralgia? And I guess the question for you, Matt, is how do we tease this out? And sort of what are you listening for in history to kind of help make that initial determination and sort of guide the rest of the visit? So I think a couple aspects here. One, obviously, there seems to be some chronicity to it. I think uh, the case had mentioned that it was about six months in. So at least if you look at a bunch of different guidelines, it looks like we're past six weeks for a threshold where you might want to be considering more long-term potential for an autoimmune issue. The reality is this screams fibromyalgia to some extent, and there's other chronic pain syndrome that might be, might be coming in here. But in an ideal way, if you could find some degree of synovitis or actual swelling in the joints on exam, that would probably be a little bit more of a tip off. And I think also uh, what we don't really have in this case, but I know it's a, a vignette, is just some other things to think about is, 
Is there evidence of sclerodactyly? Is there evidence of Raynaud's or a history of Raynaud's? Is there um, excessive dry eyes, dry mouth? Is there anything else that might really steer you toward like an ANA positive autoimmune condition, the five of those being lupus, uh, immune, um, I'm sorry, idiopathic uh, inflammatory myositis, Sjogren's, mixed connective tissue. So I think irrespective, if you don't have any of the telltale signs for that, then it's probably worth saying, all right, look, you know, Right now, it may just be that you have something like fibromyalgia. Maybe any other additional screening that might be appropriate for that would be the next to consider and move on from there. Now, if symptoms develop and change, that's where you might want to reinvestigate what's kind of going on. And I think, not to be too preachy, but a lot of us know in our day-to-day -day practice, medicine's an iterative process. You'll see somebody and your pretest probability is low, but then six months later, they come in with evidence of uh, you know digital pitting on their fingers or maybe new dry eyes, dry mm -hmm. mouth, just something else that then says, hey, I didn't capture, capture this before, but now maybe I need to reinvestigate and kind of go back through that. We did pretest. Here's the testing. Here's the post test. Let's bring the post test back for another pretest and keep kind of doing that cycling. Yeah, and I guess part of the point is like you, these. I've seen patients present with like a new rheumatoid arthritis, and they were obviously inflamed, and they could barely move. It, it right. was like really not subtle. Right. Some of the other patients, it took a while for things to really declare themselves. It sounds like that's what you're you're getting at. Uh, and, and you can kind of maybe tell by the how bad the person looks in front of you. Exactly. And by the way, just again, gray hairs, remember? Five is scler scleroderma. That was the mm -hmm. one I think I missed. All right, sorry. But that aside, yes, absolutely. And usually the ones who are really more active with a lot more going on, they're going to declare themselves much earlier. Doesn't mean you can't have rheumatoid arthritis that's really kind of smoldering or say lupus that's smoldering over a period of time. So that's where that iterative process of, of kind of following up with the patient, seeing how you're doing, getting yeah. them back in a couple of weeks, trying a medicine that fails, maybe try the next step. And, I, and, you know, despite a lot of our advances in medicine and rheumatology certainly as well, we're still blessed with the follow-up aspect, you know, okay. um, to get patients back in. How are you doing? Yeah. Are, have we made an improvement? Are we failing here? What's next? Yeah. And for someone like this who's coming in kind of largely undifferentiated, maybe we're waiting for something to declare itself, what other historical things are you asking about specifically at this initial visit to kind of at least get a sense of, of where you think things are going? Yeah, and I think a lot of that harkens back to what we had brought up before. So dry eyes, dry mouth, that's one that's kind of easily overlooked, and that can be a little difficult to assess. I mean, there you might want to ask them about how frequently do they use over-the-counter uh, eye drops? Do they have to drink frequently at night? Um, do they drink frequently throughout the day? That may not per se diagnose them with obviously sick of symptoms, but that might be suggestive of it. Certainly poor dentition as a consequence of months or years of, mm -hmm. of uh, sick of symptoms. Sclerodactyly, uh, Raynaud's is another big one. So I think for a lady in this population, certainly if she's, hey, I've had Raynaud's for five years, you know, and now you see some sclerodactyly on your exam, that's going to kind of be like, hey, there's more going on here that, that meets the eye. Um, and sclerodactyly, like sort of the, the thickening of the skin, yeah, the fingers so are curled absolutely. a little bit. Yeah, and like, that might be more of an advanced finding, but at least some sort of skin, loss of skin turgor is probably the, the better way to put that on there or better way to frame that. Uh, what else? rashes, any mm -hmm. rash that would be somewhat suspicious. Little challenge there is, of course, the malar rash, because a lot of times ladies in this age might have uh, acne rosacea, or if they're darker complected, yeah. it might be difficult to, to diagnose. So right. early acne rosacea can kind of spare the nasal labial folds, mm -hmm. and that's a classic for the malar rash, is it should spare the nasal labial folds as compared to go over it. So that can be a challenge, but that might be a little tip off too. And I see that occasionally, that's a challenge where you get somebody with fatigue and achiness and they have what probably is acne rosacea, but is interpreted as a male or rash mm -hmm. and then that ANA is fired. But again, I mean, you're, you're seeing the patient, you're trying to interpret everything that's going on. And so I, I really don't try to, it's easy to be the Monday night quarterback and say, well, it's crazy to order that ANA, but that's what you were seeing at the time. So you, you kind of mm -hmm. go with your suspicion. And then again, you update your post-test probability to be your pretest again. And can I ask about the physical examination? I feel silly at this point in my career asking, but synovitis, just talk me through a little bit of what you're looking for, what that feels like. I know it, everyone's, well, it's some bogginess, and you're like, I, I still don't yeah. know what that means necessarily. And this, and this patient specifically was saying joint pain in the knees and hands, and maybe there's some morning stiffness. We didn't get too right. deep into that yet. Yeah. yeah, no, and that's perfect. And that's a challenge, because I'll just tell you, even when I was a rheumatology fellow and we were on rounds, you know, the the gray hairs at the time, right, the ones who taught us, they would be like, well, there's some trace synovitis. And then you're sitting there going, what, what does that mean? <laughs> it's a challenge. And I guess it gets back to the old adage, you know it when you see it, right? Yeah. And so there's some there's going to be some times where you're like, wow, those, you know, second and third MCPs are pretty obviously swollen. And there's a, a degree of bogginess and just a, a very easy elicitation of pain when you press on it. But it's the repetition in the exam that I think will yeah. help you over time realize, yeah, that's probably more tender than it is swollen versus, you know, obvious swelling and tenderness. But it is hard. 
it's a challenge even for a rheumatologist. I, I don't, so and I'll speak for myself maybe, but it can so be a So assuming you don't, I don't have rheumatoid arthritis, if I feel my own joints and yeah. then feel the patients and there's a little bit of a right. sponginess or give that's to perfect. it, then right. that's like you sort of. Exactly. And you should be able to feel like between say the metacarpal and the phalange, you should be able to feel like a little a gull little, wing or mm -hmm. an indentation. And sometimes you don't get that. Now it gets a little bit harder as we get older, of course, because if you got osteoarthritis or other types of arthritis, there might be, well, osteoarthritis, I guess, being the main one. The PIPs and DIPs may really have substantial changes to them mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. reflect chronic and ra rather than acute swelling. Okay. So, more of a chronic synovitis picture, and that's, you know, it, it is. It's tough. And how much stock do you put in the morning stiffness question? Is that... It's a challenge because in a perfect world, less than 30 minutes, you would think that's probably your typical wear and tear. Mm -hmm. I know my fibromyalgia patients can have morning stiffness that lasts several hours. And yeah. so you sit there scratching your head going, okay, well, they've got what would technically fall into the range of an inflammatory arthritis, and yet they really don't have anything on exam. So again, that's where it, you know, you're looking at the whole picture. It can be very, it can, it can be challenging, and it's challenging as a rheumatologist. It can be challenging certainly as an internist as a, and a specialist. It, mm -hmm. It's hard, and I think that's that iterative process of trying to keep gathering more information and help you update yeah. your test probability. Okay. So let's say we, we conclude that she has morning stiffness that, that never quite goes away and she doesn't have any joint deformities or active uh, synovitis on, on our thorough joint exam after talking with you. We thought we think we, we got it down a little bit. Awesome. Um, let's say we even got x-rays. We don't see any erosions of the hands, the wrists, the knees yet. And we think this could maybe be early rheumatoid arthritis because she has this symmetric arthritis. It's involving the hands and she's got morning stiffness she says maybe you know maybe she has a little fatigue what what would be like your initial tests that you would order after that like right. serologies well up front you know hopefully to kind of enter the 2010 classification criteria for RA which again you know in rheumatology we use a lot more classification criteria mm -hmm. to help us with di um, homogeneity from st study standpoint like research, but they can yeah. help yeah exactly but they cer they certainly can help us in a, in a quasi diagnostic sense but they're not diagnostic and that's a talk for another day if you have synovitis plus the history that's observed, let's assume that's kind of going on here. Now you're looking at an ESR CRP that would be potentially the next mm -hmm. assess inflammation and and get you know the rheumatoid factor and anti CCP and and with yeah. the 2010 classification criteria, those are the ones that would be the next. That if you're getting positives on those, so either low or high amounts of inflammation or or a, a strong or weak positive rheumatoid factor or CCP, those would start to give you certain amounts of points that might push you more toward diagnosis of RA. Yeah. What about the, I mean, I, I've heard some people say they order like a CBC and a CMP. I, I have seen like elevated white count and some liver yeah. enzymes that are elevated. And, you know, I don't know if you throw your analysis in, if you're ever considering, could this be an arthritis or just like your simple oste osteoarthritis, or is this like a inflammatory arthritis? What else do you order? Well, if I'm thinking RA, I usually limit it to those okay. uh, with some of the novel markers that we'll talk about here, depending on clinical suspicion. If I'm thinking more lupus, you know, yeah. or even Sjogren's, I'm thinking kind of more in that flavor of an autoimmune condition, urinalysis. Usually I get a urine protein creatinine ratio just to make it easy. And my, uh, my, my lazy rheumatology ways, I guess, speaking for myself, not us as a community. Um, I don't want to know if there's blood in the urine, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Because <laughs> you don't want to get stuck with this. Amen, this amen. I was like, every, right, you know, it's like you're a 65 year old lady who you're just like, oh, I know that there's. Well, I'm not worried about the cysto, more just the UTI. I guess yeah. that's the only thing I should say. I, I don't want to know anything about a UTI. Just is there protein or not? And if there's a lot of protein, that's important. You this know? past week, I I ordered <laughs> the UA and the urine protein creatinine right. for a patient that I was working up for this, and. They had microscopic hematuria, no protein. So oh, I'm like, right. darn it, now I, I, I gotta go. Exactly. You know, and I'm not, a, and I'm just bringing that up in a humorous note. I mean, obviously, you get a urinalysis, and if there's pro, and if there's blood and protein, sure, you, you work that as appropriate. For me, I guess I've just gotten kind of lazy in the sense that if I open the hood and I see that there's certainly like two grams of proteinuria, that's put me down more yes. a lupus Sjogren's kind of path there, and then I'll get the UA. You Got know, it. and that might give me additional information about what else is kind of coming through, creatinated red blood cells good, or something Good thing Dr. Nature. Paul Williams, America's PCP, is working on a uh, hematuria episode sure. that will be coming oh, out bless. very yeah. soon. Yeah. Well, yeah. Just, I feel like, yeah, the, these initial tests, like this is, like, invariably will come back with like an elevated set rate, but a normal CRP and maybe the rheumatoid factor is positive, but the CCP is negative, and you're like, oh, well, now, right. now, now what do I do with this, which I guess is what we're going to be talking about the entire back half of this episode, yeah. I hope. Right. Now, I'm sorry to interrupt, if you don't mind, real quick, Matt. So one other thing to think about is, just to answer your question, yeah, so there are some kind of key opinion leaders that suggest getting a CBC in the sense that if you see an elevated white blood cell count, that might be a tip-off. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, anything that kind of drives you, is there inflammation? Now, again, just looking at the, the boundaries set up by the 2010 classification criteria for RA, since we're on that right now, 
there's nothing in there about a CBC or whatever, but that does give you more credence, right? So you got an elevated ESR, maybe a slightly elevated CRP, but the person's got a BMI of 30, and then you have some, you know, leukocytosis, and there's no other clear reason. You're like, mm, all right, there might be some actual inflammation here mm -hmm. that's not related to cystitis or uh, steroid use or, you know, you name it. Yeah. So, and then the Chem 7, it, sure, that's probably not unreasonable to do. I'll do that based on what I think potentially is going to happen down the road with regard to treatments. Okay, got it. So oh, that makes sense. Let's give you some. Uh, let's give you some labs here. So yeah. we we have a mildly increased white count uh, and CRP. The kidney and liver functions are normal, um, or the liver tests. Sorry to my our, our hepatology uh, <laughs> listeners. And uh, rheumatoid factor is positive, but CCP, which is now I'm, I'm told ACPA for anti-citrullinated uh, protein yeah. antibody yeah, or exactly. peptide no. antibody. No. Peptide, yeah. ACPA, yeah. yeah. Anti-CCP yeah. or ACPA, you might see it, listeners. Yeah. Um, so let's say C the CCP is negative, but the rheumatoid factor is positive. Matt, what do we? What do you think right. about those? Well, let's assume again she has synovitis. So at this point, if she's got true synovitis that you're like, those are definitely swollen, tender joints, mm -hmm. and she's got at least more than 10, and she's had her symptoms for a couple of months now, obviously, and your ESR and CR, uh, ESR is elevated and your rheumatoid factor is elevated, I I'd always, always have to look back, back at the guidelines. Yeah. You're pretty much there at that point by saying, hey, I think you got rheumatoid arthritis. And then if you feel that's within your wheelhouse, you can certainly start treatments for that. Um, if not, send it over to rheumatology, obviously, just saying, mm -hmm. here's what I found. And kind of you, yay or nay, you'd be the, the season, yeah. that, so to speak, to, to give the thumbs up or thumbs down. And is the cutoff for rheumatoid factor somewhere around 30? or it 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 Sure, it depends on your lab. I think mine is like 14. I, I, what would be helpful, rheumatoid factor, that's a talk for another day, too, is if you get this kind of rheumatoid factor of 17, you're kind of like, ah, you mm -hmm. know, it's a low positive, and I'm not really sure what to yeah. do there. Rheumatoid factor with so a rheumatoid factor of 17 with a CCP of 250. Okay, yeah. that's like you know slam dunk there. Rheumatoid factor of 270. Okay, well then there's a differential that goes with maybe Hep C screening, Hep B screening. But you're probably heading in that direction if those come back negative. Right. You know for Sjogren's RA something along those lines. Okay. And we may have, have glazed over this, uh, and apologies, this is a repeat part, but I, I don't know if we talked about sort of your approach to imaging after these sort of initial, after this initial presentation. Is this someone that you would get x-rays of the hands and feed we, or wrist right away? Do we? We did give some x-rays. We jumped ahead of that just to, I guess the way that the way that the case was written was just to like take that off the table. But yeah, yeah. when would you get those? Would you get those that after was my question, or yes. before the... I usually get them up front in part okay. because if you get some of that ambiguity and you see some evidence of interstitial lung disease on chest x-ray, obviously not the best tool for that. But if you do, that okay. would be kind of saying, hey, you got somebody who's got all these serologic findings, this historical stuff, and they've got interstitial lung disease, you're like, hmm, all right, this is starting to get a little suspicious. Or if you, and this may not happen per se within six to 12 months, but let's say you get hand x-rays at the start of this appointment, yeah. and you find there are actual erosions involving mm -hmm. the MCPs or PIPs, kind of these periarticular right. erosions, you, you might, you're there. I mean, essentially at that point, right. you have right. erosions, a, a positive rheumatoid factor, an ESR, all these clinical symptoms, like that's starting to pull you in there. And so my my understanding is the erosions are a later finding. Like you they, might, if you're getting early, if you're catching someone with early rheumatoid, you might not see those. Exactly, right. And that may be a distinction we'll talk about here is whether or not to get MRI. I don't want to get the cart before the horse, I guess. But yeah, absolutely. So yeah, right. you would hope, and we the aspiration that we have as rheumatologists is to capture them early, and actually a lot of great interesting stuff now trying to get people in the pre-RA phase, yeah. to capture them early, treat them aggressively, and never let those erosions come up. Like we right. never want to have a hand damage. Yeah. The stuff that I trained with in the late 90s was you were guaranteed to go to just severe deformities and joint replacements. That era should never hopefully happen. Yeah. And it remains a challenge now as a rheumatologist because I'll get patients come in and I'm like, yeah, I don't really know, do you really have RA? Well then CCP's, I'll repeat a CCP, okay, it's positive. So the whole idea is we really want to keep people in remission and control and never let those erosions develop, yeah. never let the lung stuff come up, never go down that road. And this is one of the diseases where once you have it under control, you kind of keep your foot on the throat Amen. of the disease. You don't like just like say, let's see how you do off your exactly. off your medication. Right. Exactly. And I tell okay. patients to kind of hit, we, we don't know how to hit, and this is an 80s reference here, the eject button from the cassette player just uh -huh. yet, right? So I'm going to take my double <laughs> But we know how to hit pause. We're 80s. We're kids of the awesome. 80s. All right, yeah, good. Yeah. We're, we're, we're all, yeah, so we're birds of a feather. That's good. So I know how to hit the pause button. I don't know how to hit eject, but there's very smart people trying to figure out how to hit the eject. Yeah. And maybe one good. day we'll be there. Yeah. So in this case, we gave, you know, she, she didn't have synovitis by our exam, but I probably would send this patient because she's got yeah. enough features, a positive rheumatoid factor. I'd probably would send her to you yeah. to see if you, what you think. Absolutely. And, uh, and maybe she is someone that's early. Maybe, maybe she's someone we caught, but this person has one, she's a positive rheumatoid factor, no synovitis. The CCP was negative. 
what else can we do that might help us figure out? And what's right. the new stuff, the fancy right. stuff? Because our listeners like to be well informed, Paul. Right? Like they want to, sure. they want to show off. The leading edge of the blade. That's yeah. right. <laughs> that, that is the tip of the spear, as we said. So, what's Force, the new yeah. stuff that Paul and I will try to remember? These auto antibodies. <laughs> right. Hey, everybody. This is Watto. I just wanted to break in here and set up this next section where we're going to talk about two newer tests that you might think about ordering for patients with suspected rheumatoid arthritis. As we get into, these can help you pick up some extra cases uh, who are missed by the rheumatoid factor or the CCP testing, respectively. So these are 14-3-3 ADA protein. That's an inflammatory marker of sorts that you can send. And then finally, the second one is the anti car p antibodies, that's anti-carbamylated protein is what it stands for. And uh, those can pick up another maybe 10 or 15% of patients that you might miss with the more traditional testing for RA. So with that, I just wanted to set up this next segment and let's get back to the show. Well, there's actually several. So I'm going to cover just two because there's another thing called an anti-SA antibody that's really been around for, it's old, but it's new. It's a citrullinated, citrullinated vimentin. I talk, I think, beyond this, but what, what I'm presenting here at the conference are two additional RA labs. One is what's called a 1433 ADA protein, mm -hmm. and I believe that got its name because of the way it patterned out on a gel electrophoresis. Uh, the name is really kind of annoying, I guess, but the reality is it's an isoform. There's actually six or seven of them, that like these proteins that like to dimerize. It's the sixth of seven, and it's unique to brain and to synovium. Now, let me step back for a second. I guess I'm getting, again, the cart before the horse. As the trends in rheumatology have kind of gone for RA, we're trying to take the needle from the 90s where it was established disease yeah. to the 2010s early disease to now pre-RA. So in that process, as when you look at the RF and CCP specifically, for early RA, you're missing, for established RA, you're missing about 12% of patients with the RFs and CCPs. With the rheumatoid factor and CCP for early, you're missing about 28%. So mm. there's a big gap there. And we, uh, the whole idea, like I told you earlier, is we want to capture this very early. We never yeah. want erosions. We never want deformities. We don't want any of that at all. So these other proteins, uh, these other labs might be helpful. Back on track, 1433 ADA is really an inflammatory marker. Mm -hmm. And so it's not an antibody. So that's kind of like you know an adjunct, maybe if you want to think of it as in the same family as the ESR and CRP. Okay. And so a value of 0.2 nanograms per milliliter or higher is considered positive. I will say when it's the 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, I'm like, ah, what does that mean? Now, if they're 0 0.4 and they've got a rheumatoid factor of like uh, 230, I think we're there. Mm -hmm. If they're a, more of an OA picture with 0.4, I'm like, oh, I think we'll just watch them wait. I wouldn't diagnose it based solely on that. Um, but it, it, the strength of that test comes in conjunction with other antibodies yeah. that you might have. And we do think that when your rheumatoid factor and or CCP and or both positive, that adds another 15% that you're going to capture if that protein's positive too. Okay. 0.8 or higher is what really kind of sets, you're like, you're there, you've got an abnormal test. And again, I wouldn't diagnose RA alone just based on that. And again, that's kind of staying within the 2010 yeah. classification criteria. But that can, again, be a, a, of help to you there. Did you and mean if, if the, CC, like the CCP and the R rheumatoid factor are negative, but you're still suspicious and the 14-33 right. ADA is positive, then, then yeah. that might capture extra people? Absolutely. So okay. that, yeah, that's all I did is we're trying to capture extra. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's why I kind of gave that and or, and or kind of thing. Yeah, so you're, trying to, you're going to probably capture about 15% more people with, okay. in that scenario there with that 14-33 protein and earlier disease too, which is nice because you'll yeah, capture right. them early. In the and this seems yeah. like this would be a send out lab that, uh, <laughs> I don't know if uh, I haven't tried to order it. Maybe now yeah. I'll, I'll look into it, but I know for me initially, uh, it was, uh, let's see. So rolled out in the mid 2010s, uh, working with lab, they were, they were pretty straight. Okay. And I, yeah, right. I think it, it should be relatively easy if you work with your, your lab department to get that kind of squared away. Okay. It's been around for almost about eight to 10 years now or seven to 10 years. So All right. I think it, it I'm just late to, to hear about it. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, I think, we're still, it's kind of, uh, back a couple of years ago, it was a little bit more half-baked, mm -hmm. and now we're getting to the near completion of it, right? Yeah. So, um, if you will, in the baking process. Sort of figuring think, out where to use exactly. it. Exactly. Okay. You've got to have a lot more uh, studies roll out. And then on the CARB piece, so CARB stands for carbamylation, um, <laughs> but the when you look at the likelihood ratio for the CARB P, it's only, I think, about one or somewhere in there. It's really not as good. So with the CARB P, if that's positive and everything else is negative, you might capture another 5 to 10% of patients with it. And my caution there is, again, we're not in the same arena as the 2010 classification criteria with these. A positive CAR-P, not, not a really convincing exam. It might be like something you want to watch or wait. I, this is the way I would take it yeah. as a rheumatologist. I think as an internist, if you were to get that test, and you're like, I don't know what to make of this, boom, send it over to rheumatology, let us figure it out. 
the reality is I would probably watch and wait somebody. But if you're RF positive at 100 and you've got a, C, a carb P that is anti-carb P that is like, I don't know, 40 units or whatever, mm-hmm. the, the, you know, that's a positive test. I think anything over 20 or 25, then you're there. Like, I think at that point, you probably say, look, with the elevated ESR, the leukocytosis, your clinical history, and these other autoantibodies were probably there. Just the key takeaway is that the two of them, one, they're not within the confines of the current classification criteria, but they can still clinically educate us. And then two, the CAR-P, I don't think really has the strength that the 1433 has, and mm-hmm. those are still not as good as the CCP. And I wonder, yeah, I wonder if these will be incorporated in future guidelines or, or just when this is written about in the future, there'll be gui- more guidance on how to use these so we can make the earlier, that pre-RA right. diagnosis and use that to right. uh, treat people early, prevent any kind of joint deformity from, exactly. from happening. I, yeah, I don't know where that is in the process. I wouldn't be surprised if there, I mean, 2010 has been a while, but I still think those cli- criteria are, are serving us well. I don't know how they're gonna incorporate a lot of this new stuff. And there's yeah. still more antibodies beyond it, but those are the two more mainstream ones I think that are kind of out there. Yeah, given that I don't know what to do with the RF half the time, I think these will, I'll probably leave to my friendly neighborhood rheumatologist, but yeah. it's good to know that they exist. Well, I think, so let's just say that our for, for, to round out our first case, Jocelyn, this was our 44-year-old female with the, the knee and hand pain. Let's say that we actually sent her to you. We thought she yeah. did have early RA and she was started on treatment. So happy ending for her. But let's, yeah. let's go to another case, uh, which maybe I think maybe the tougher of the two in some ways. So Paul, do you want to read this one? Sure. We're going to now be talking about Sharon, who's a 33-year-old female. She has a history of rosacea, obesity with a BMI of 34 and low back pain. This should sound hauntingly familiar. She recently saw dermatology for hair loss. Her iron indices and thyroid testing were normal, but an ANA was positive at 1 to 80 with a speckled pattern. She's had Raynaud's phenomenon since she was a teenager. No cardiopulmonary complaints. She does not have dry eyes or dry mouth because we took a great history. On exam, she does not have synovitis, and as much as we can tell, she does not have sclerodactyly. There is no uh, objective muscle weakness. She does have mild erythema of the chin, the cheeks, and the nose, which include the nasolabial folds. So Sharon is coming to us with this now. The abnormal lab is really the thing that we're going to focus on, at least to start, of this this abnormal ANA. Um, and I think everyone at this table has probably been guilty. Well, we won't include you, Matt, but Matt Watto. I think we've probably at least checked one ANA that's come back sort of vaguely positive. And we're like, oh, no, now what? Yes. So I guess <laughs> for right. you, what, what what are we to do with this information? Um, and how would you explain right. it to the patient when she's coming to us? Like, I've got this abnormal lab. Does this mean I have lupus? Like, where? Right. what do we do with this? No, and, and that's really good. And you know, one last thought about the case we just talked about too. As you see your friendly neighborhood rheumatologist kind of doing some more of these tests, you'll eventually get that pick up into your practice, you know, yeah. that'll imprint on you about where to go. So for this case, I think you're, you know, that as a rheumatologist, and I think you would hopefully feel comfortable doing this as an internist, but I, I get that. I mean, it can be challenging as an internist. Med- medicine is so broad and, and deep in many areas. You're really kind of done with her. I don't think there's any other testing that would need to be done. You got a one to 80 speckled pattern. That's probably just reflective that she's a lady and a human on planet Earth. And you're <laughs> going to have a positive ANA at one to 80 and probably about 20%, 15% of wow. ladies, you know, that high. It's even higher for a one to 40, less for a one to 60. So, um, and the, the, the pattern kind of is insightful, but not very specific at this point. And you really have a history and a physical that seem to go with some al- other alternative diagnosis. So you really, at this point, could pump the brakes and say, look, yeah, I know you've got that, but I'm not really convinced that that's meaningful for where your disease is at this mm-hmm. process. If anything new develops, and maybe it's worth repeating that down the road as clinically guided. Yeah. I'm not saying to follow sequential ANAs because sometimes the, the primary care docs will do that or you know our allied health professionals. And you'll get this up and down in the A DNA, which is not really helpful either. Just again, that iterative process of, okay, we did this at time point A, and this is what we were thinking at the time, but now we're B, three, six, 12 months down the road, and there's new clinical symptoms. Then that's time to go back and maybe re update what you're, you know, kind of doing right. test wise. But I think here you could potentially stop. And I, I think the questions will go on. We'll talk about the differences in the testing because that's certainly one place that ANA testing is really, unfortunately, not very easy because of several different things and yeah. automation and a few other things we'll talk about. Because when, when you look at the workup for hair loss, which we talked about this on the show before, uh, if it's non scarring hair loss, to me, the ANA doesn't really have a role unless, like you, unless there's a lot of other features where you think lupus might be part of it. Right. Um, and I've, I've seen some patients get, uh, several patients get an ANA sent and it comes back like this. That's kind of was the, that was my impetus to put this case here. Yeah. Uh, and then the rosacea thing too, you know, you, you talked about a little bit early on that lupus commonly and spares the nasolabial folds, but rosacea can do that as well. Early. So yeah. 
uh, how do you differentiate between those two? I read, uh, I read that maybe if the person has a lot of like inflammatory symptoms of the eyes as well, that's more of a rosacea thing than a lupus thing. But I'm not sure what else you find helpful with the malar it, rash question. Time. Time. Okay. Yeah, just that iterative process again of watching your patient, how you're doing, and getting them back in a couple of months, maybe trying on, uh, trying on, yeah. uh, on some acne rosacea therapy if you feel comfortable with okay. that. Maybe getting yeah, two cents on it. You know, whatever that, whatever I think floats your comfort level and the busyness of your practice. Um, you know, it's easy to say, well, you should do everything and that's not the case. It just yeah. what you feel comfortable with or what you feel, you know. So I think here I'd give it more the tincture of time rather than trying to just overdiagnose something that may not be there. And I've now seen, I think, two patients who developed, they were in the hospital with like acute lupus and I saw the malar rash come out like yeah. over hours, uh, <laughs> of, certainly over days. And to me, that was like, you know, uh, that, that was just very mm -hmm. striking. Right. I'm not sure if that's classic for it or if they can have this chronic you know, malar rash that just doesn't go away or it's there for weeks, weeks or... For your subacute, for, I'm sorry, for your systemic lupus erythematosus, so your SLE, yeah. that one should, that can be very acute. That's a very quick on and off rash. Okay. Some of my, less so my subacute cutaneous lupus and then certainly more for my chronic cutaneous lupus, you can get this kind of chronic malar rash okay. that just is so there then it would cosmetically, be... yeah. So that, that, can you have a chronic malar rash? Yeah, that might really, for, that certainly seems to suggest that you're falling more in the chronic cutaneous lupus, which interestingly enough, only about 10% of patients actually have systemic lupus with it. Mm -hmm. So malar rash, 90% of them likely have lupus. Like at that point, you're, you're there. Um, again, like with what you described, yeah. if you're more the chronic, that's, you know, that's still lupus, like skin lupus, and it's confusing, but it's really less likely to be global lupus or systemic lupus or arthritis. Okay. Okay, cool. Paul, you looked like you had a question in there. I, I might have, I might have talked over. No, you. no, you're you're great. No more. I thought I was, I was going to say, and, and we might be jumping ahead a little bit here. Most of the ANAs, I, I won't even, usually, you know, I'm very good at blaming myself and feeling guilty about things, but most of the sort of the randomly positive ANAs I've seen have been positive part of order sets. Mm -hmm. So if someone has a, an acute yes. kidney injury, or if someone has an acute liver injury, or something along those lines, like it just it's one of the battery of tests that you just sort of click a bunch of buttons and then it kind of comes back vaguely positive and you're like, oh no, now what? Right. Um, I guess, so where to go from here, I guess, is do you have a differential for a patient who just has a positive ANA and nothing else, or is it just a matter of one of those things? Like, I guess, how do you, how do you think about that broadly? Yeah, so two things real quick. One, there's always been a part of me that leans, and maybe, I don't know if it's because now I'm a specialist, I think if you're dealing with visceral organ involvement, and, and I'm gonna speak for myself, and this is not per se global guidance from key opinion leaders, and I, wouldn't, I don't consider myself a key opinion leader. So if somebody comes in with proteinuria, right? Checking an ANA there is probably not unreasonable because you want to make sure you can, I, I've had two or three cases throughout the years where they are pretty much just lupus nephritis and there's nothing else going mm -hmm. on. So um, bad, uh, severe pleurisy, uh, interstitial lung disease. Like those are probably the cases where if you, uh, for me and my, my kind of tiny brain, again, is the gray hairs keep digging deeper. If you're starting to destroy organs, probably not bad as a specialist to maybe consider checking it. I, I think though the pitfall, as you very astutely bring up, Paul, is that you might get this ANA of one to 80 speckle pattern, then you're like, well, what does that mean? And again, rheumatology can kind of help you there, but that, that's, that's neither here nor there. I think the bigger takeaway probably for our listening audience is the ANA testing has kind of evolved over the years as technology has evolved, and there's really two different kind of flavors, and it's important for you to know which one you're dealing with to mm -hmm. give you further insight. The first is the indirect immunofluorescence. And there you've got a cell that's lining a, a slide, and it's, it's usually what's called a human epithelial cell. You wash the patient's blood over it, you tag whatever antibodies hang behind after you've washed it, and then there's a fluorescein molecule that lights up, and essentially now the, there's a technician looking at that slide saying, that's a speckled pattern, and based on the dilutions, you're right. one to 80. So this case seems to obviously suggest that they did an, in, they did an indirect immunofluorescence, or IIF. In the mid to late 2000s, and more so that you might find is you'll get to these what are called solid phase assays, and those are similar concept in the sense that you have a bead or you've got a plate or a well, and there's some sort of antibody, or I'm sorry, there's some sort of antigen, so it's an mm -hmm. autoantigen that you would have at the, at the bottom of that, either recombinant, purified, you name it, however they put it in there. Um, it's attached to the well, same thing, put the blood in there, uh, label it with another in, uh, another immunoglobin, and it used to be enzymatic. Now it's a lot more uh, color based and uh, lasers, and you know a bunch of stuff to capture that data much quicker than just looking at color changes. Mm -hmm. But the concept is that there's some sort of antibody again sticking to that. Those are quicker to do, but they don't always they enhance the sensitive uh, specificity, but they really forfeit a little bit of the sensitivity. Indirect immunofluorescence gives you more sensitivity, but not the specificity. And trying to understand between which of those your lab is getting will probably help you down the road. Again, I think the easy way is if you're getting a titer and a pattern, 
most likely going to be indirect immunofluorescence. Yeah. And at that point, you're kind of like, I know it's going to pick up stuff, but it doesn't really help me rule in disease. And so that's why I think here you can kind of pump the brakes and say, okay, it was 1 to 80. 1 to 640 speckle pattern, okay, different story. Maybe at that point now you need to start getting some of the extractable nuclear antigen, like a DNA and a Smith and all the other ones that mm -hmm. kind of make up the alphabet soup of rheumatology. Yeah, sometimes there's the reflex. Uh, you can order an ANA yes. with reflex to the, right. the extractable nuclear antigens and... Is there an absolute tighter value that raises your eyebrows? I know this is probably not a fair question to ask, but like one to 80, one to 40, you can be like, Meh. especially if there's nothing else going on here, but is there just a number in and of itself where you're like, okay, this is probably significant? It's more shades of gray. I think as you hit one to 320, you're like, well, okay, something's going on there. And then one to 640 or higher, but I've seen that also with patients who have Hashimoto's, mm. you know, and so you do a big old yeah. workup, you find out the DNA is negative, Smith's negative, everything else is negative as part of that workup is we'll get somebody, you know, one to 640 ANA, speckled pattern, some other pattern, and um, you do the rest of the workup with the auto, with the extractable nuclear antigens, and you find out all that's negative, and it turns out they have actually Hashimoto's. Um, that's, so uh, I think the higher the number, certainly the more serial dilutions that you need, obviously the AK, the higher the tighter, mm -hmm. a little bit more important that is suggestive of, but it may not always go with an, a, a rheumatologic autoimmunomus. It could be, again, thyroid or hepatitis or something different in, the, in gotcha. that flavor. Like something's maybe going on, but not necessarily exactly. autoimmune. Gotcha. Right. <laughs> Keep your differentials broad. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, and you mentioned earlier uh, that there's, there's the ones, the diseases that commonly have a positive ANA, and you said there's about five of them. Uh, so I just wanted to recap, and I'm trying to find in my, I know I had it out Wait, here. I think the gray hair is receded, so, so scleroderma, <laughs> uh -huh. Sjogren's, my, oh, my, my, uh, my professor's my hair. All right, mixed connective tissue, lupus, uh, idiopathic immune, uh, inflammatory myositis. Yeah. Holy cow, all right, good. Okay, yeah, <laughs> and lupus can be drug-induced or the yes, systemic, right. the systemic then, type. Thinking, yeah, more systemic, but yes, yeah. drug-induced, so lupus can certainly give a positive ANA. I don't, I don't, I've never made the diagnosis of mixed connective tissue disease. Usually that seems like that's a rheumatologist. Yeah. Like you send them there where they, <laughs> yeah, they've yeah. got some other, that's like a little bit of what, it is, is it usually of, scleroderma, the lupus, you, you get like Sjogren, Sjogren? Yeah, you can, yeah, usually the, okay. the high titer ANA with a strong positive anti-RMP or U1-RMP. Okay. And then there you've got a little like, yeah, it's the, you know, the, the, the smorgasbord of some sclerodactyly and maybe some myositis and maybe a little interstitial lung disease. Okay. Like, well, that sounds like that's mixing in connective tissue. And your slides had, I thought this was helpful. So a positive ANA, but no rheumatologic disease would be maybe autoimmune hepatitis, right. autoimmune thyroid disease, uh, PBC, P idiopathic pulmonary hypertension and multiple sclerosis. So yeah. those are some things you could few. think about that would, right. would have that. Exactly. I think I've actually seen recently since uh, I've seen a patient with Hashimoto's that was really like not yet treated and new yeah. and they had a high positive ANA and I wonder if that's what it was from. Yeah. I think they were still seeing rheumatology to sort it out, but yeah. that seems like that could have been it. So, okay, so this is helpful. Um, so the positive ANA one to 80 is like, Mm, but it depends on what else is going on clinically, like exactly. like most of what we've talked right. about so far. One of the few patterns, I'm going to bring this up earlier, one of the few patterns that really may be a little bit more telltale is if you're getting an anti-centromere pattern. So let's mm -hmm. say you get a 1 to 640 for the titer and an anti-centromere pattern. And especially if you have some evidence of, like if you have sclerodactyly, you're kind of there. But let's say they've got history of nodes with maybe some digital infarcts or something else strange. Then you're like, yeah, there's something that's that's strange things are afoot, you know, okay. at that point. But and again, any questions, hey, room to, how can we help you? What's going on yeah. here? Give and that's the limited form, form of scleroderma right. that is associated with that. Okay. So we have we we've given our differential diagnosis for the ANA, both the non rheumatologic causes and the rheumatologic causes. We talked a little bit about how there's the immunofluorescent version, that's where you get this. Uh, the tighter and the pattern. Right. And then there's the newer ones, which could be molecular or enzyme linked. And yeah, they've got a whole bunch of those. There's many right. different flavors of that. Okay. So uh, we talked about, I, I think... I think we talked a little bit about like what to do now when this person when this person comes to you that had an ANA that you just don't re you're not really convinced they have any rheumatologic right. disease going on. You said you can sort of let time mm -hmm. be the arbiter to yeah. steal a phrase from our friend Elliot Tapper. Uh, so basically, you can wait to see if anything else declares itself. Um, Paul, how do you how do you handle this, or do you have any other questions about like this uh, this area before we we move on a little bit? Uh, no, I, I mean. I, I would probably handle it exactly, surprisingly, actually like the case where I would tell the patient, I'm not sure I would have checked this in the first place. I don't think there's anything to worry about here and we can just sort of watch things for right now is yeah. probably how I would leave things be. And we tried to, it seems like Raynaud's is pretty common yes. and you can have Raynaud's. Uh, I, I know, you know, my wife gets Raynaud's right. and she doesn't have lupus. Right. Uh, there's, so it's, it's kind of just depends and right. 
uh, how do you talk to somebody so they have the positive ANA, they have, uh, or, or just with Raynaud's in general, is there anything that heightens your concern about that condition? Uh, well, again, it gets back to a lot of the physical and uh, history and physical exam, right? So let's say you have Raynaud's and sclerodactically, right? Mm -hmm. Or some evidence of skin, loss of skin turgor distal to the MCP joints, right? That's going to be a tip off of like, hey, there's probably a little bit more happening here. Um, digital infarcts, pitting, loss of pulp at the end of the fingertips. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what else? Dry eyes, dry mouth might be another kind of tip off or maybe Sjogren's. Um, it gets back to a lot of the history and physical about what may be el what else might yeah. be out there. For us, uh, for, and for those in the audience who might be skilled at doing it, nail fold capillaroscopy can be very helpful. So mm -hmm. if you take a look at the nail fold capillaries and, and kind of, uh, usually I get a derm light and try to take a look with one of the derm, uh, derm light things. Uh, the old school way was taking some um, oil immersion, you know, that you used to use for the slides and taking an ophthalmoscope to try to use that to help oh, highlight the capillaries. <laughs> that's cool. Not sure. Yeah, that's really old school. I think if anything, derm light makes it a lot easier and you have to get people's hands messy, I guess, for, for whatever that's worth. Abnormal changes there. That can be a little problematic, I think. I'm trying to think of this as an internist. You know, that might be a little problematic if you're not doing that all the time. And to be honest with you, with yeah. the business, my clinic, I'm not really kind of routinely doing it unless I have a high suspicion I'll go run back and grab my derm light. Okay. Um, so I think that would be another tip off, but, it, but another high positive ANA. So I think if you've got somebody who has Raynaud symptoms and a strong positive ANA, that may not per se relate to something from a systemic autoimmune standpoint. Mm -hmm. They might have Hashimoto's or whatever, but that might give you a little bit more of, hey, there could be something more happening here and maybe worth further investigating. Okay. Again, I think it gets back to your Renaud's with the strong positive ANA, say 1 to 1280, but there's really no sclerodactyly, there's nothing else going on. You may be going, okay, well, these might be two different processes, and maybe the Renaud's is just by itself, but the ANA is due to something different. Right. And I think as clinically driven, you might go, okay, well, you do have the non-scarring alopecia, you've got scarring alopecia, you've got dry eyes, dry mouth, you've got whatever, that might steer you more toward extractable okay. you know, nuclear engines, or no, your TSH was, you know, 12. Okay, yeah. maybe now it's time for us to get, you know, maybe you're there, you have Hashimoto's or something. So. We, would, we probably wouldn't be shotgunning the, if we're, if we're ordering an ANA, it should be done, I guess, kind of to summarize what my take home is. And Paul, I'd, I'd love to hear if you have uh, anything to add to this. Take home is, you know, try to recognize, do they fit into any of these buckets or do they have features of multiple things, in which case I'd think mixed connective tissue disease, mm -hmm. but uh, that would make me want to get an ANA. Is there a diagnosis here that the ANA might help us sort of support, like be further evidence that that's what might be going on here? Right. Don't just order the ANA for the patient that says, I have fatigue. Right. Uh, and and uh, in, in that case, it may not be helpful. And there's either a reflex or maybe a second round test could be where you get all these ENAs. The ex right. Is it extractable nuclear antigens or yeah. antibodies? I don't know. A antigens, e ENA, right? Because, yeah, yeah, you're looking for anti-Smith, anti-Rho, okay. uh, anti-Law, anti-whatever, right. yeah. So that would sort of be your second round of tests once exactly. you have a positive ANA and everything. You don't have to right. send those from the start, yeah, which I no, think a lot of people right. sometimes do, maybe because they come in a panel or something. Right. I, I do actually sometimes, because I try to adjust my thinking a little bit, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, as to actually having a differential diagnosis. I, I think to your point, like I think we sometimes fall into the trap of this feels kind of roomy. So you just do the ANA and then it comes back sort of weird. Like So I think like this sounds like lupus, so I might check like an ANA and a double-stranded DNA. Like I, I prefer to have a differential in mind rather than just sort of checking for something, yeah. quote something, you know, rheumatologic, because right. I think that's where I've got myself into trouble with sort of non-specific tests and then not, a non-specific differential. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I, one last, no, these are great thoughts. And if I may interject, I don't want to dissuade anybody in the audience listening to this from doing what they think is clinically relevant, right? So if that's in your differential and you're pretty strongly convinced that mm -hmm. it could be there, then go ahead and get it, right? But it's always, I guess, the key at the end of the day, and which I hope this certainly podcast does, and maybe the lecture here and then any other articles that come out in the future, just, um, you know, in, in, in say, annals. You know, um, just kind of, it's an iterative process and know why you're getting the test, right? Now, right. I know, and I know we talked a little bit about the indirect immunofluorescence and the solid phase assays. And I, and I don't think even, it's important to know what test you're doing, but it all gets back to the test, right? If the test has inherent limitations, that's going to limit what you're going to take away from it. But there's a little bit of time that can be built into some of this. You know, I never want us to miss somebody who we could have caught earlier. Sure. But I think the converse, the current uh, switch is flipped the other way that, ANAs are just, and I think it's less internist, and I'm not trying to point fingers, it just, there's a lot of ANAs being ordered and people really don't know why they're doing it. And, yeah. And just cool to pump the brakes. What are we, what's the differential here? Uh, lupus is really low. Okay, ANA's probably not needed. You know, or ANA was one to 40. We're, we're like done. I think at this point we can kind of move along. Yeah. 
And uh, just for the audience, uh, as a note, when we were saying idio idiopathic inflammatory myopathies or myositis, I that's that used to be called polymyositis, and now it's well, that's recognizing it's yeah, a bunch of different things. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> actually six, it's several different flavors. We did now an episode on yeah, that, so yeah, they yeah. could they could refer back yes. to uh, last summer, <laughs> summer 2022. We did an, an idiopathic inflammatory myo changing, myopathy yeah. my myopathy myositis episode, yeah. so you can you can go back to that. So we'll. Uh, I think we should be wrapping up here. So probably this is a great time to ask you for some take-home points. I know you it kind of just gave us some great take-home points, but yeah. from the overall episode, we talked about the patient with possible rheumatoid arthritis, and then we talked about the patient with a positive AR ANA. What maybe one or two take-home points on on those topics? Yeah. So one, it's always your pretest for suspicion, right? And your pretest suspicion is always updated by your history, your physical, and any other data that you're gathering. And it may be that even with some scant labs that you do, like, hey, this person just seems like maybe they have inflammation, we get an ESR, CRP, and a, and a CBC. And they all show some degree of inflammation, which may or may not be related to BMI or something different. All right, well, maybe now it is time to check a rheumatoid factor or mm -hmm. CCP, depending on what I'm seeing or, or hearing. Or call them back in and re-examine them. You know, because exams are dynamic, right, obviously. And then, of course, that's the, the global point of how you want to keep updating your pretest probability for your future t test to help you get that diagnosis. But then, of course, knowing the strengths and weaknesses of the test is always key. And I don't think as a as an internist or even a subspecialist, you have to know all the nitty gritty details about indirect immunofluorescence versus solid phase assays. Because to be honest with you, as a rheumatologist, I understand some of that, but at a very cursory high level, it's not delve into the weeds. It's just know what's my lab getting back to me as a result, and what are some of those strengths and weaknesses from a global perspective, right? My solid phase assays are gonna bring up a lot more information as compared to maybe the indirect. Um, and then you might figure out over time that your practice, you might wanna have some degree of, uh, a lot of labs are now going to this reflex that if the ANA is positive over a certain threshold, it will screen for the other extractive yeah. gland and right. to help you. Yeah. So it, it really, I mean, I think it's the, the essence of medicine is we treat our patients. We don't treat numbers. We don't treat antibodies. They're there to help us, but we treat our patient. You Paul, know? Paul and I lament about this a lot of the time. <laughs> just, just, just give me a black and white answer. answer. Tell, me tell me yes me or no, yes, what yes. should I do? But right. it's never that easy. That's why internal medicine is interesting. And yes. that's that. I guess that keeps us all, all in job. So <laughs> thank you so much for all your time today. Yeah. Uh, you're presenting so much at this meeting. You still said yes to this interview. So thank you. That was this awesome. A great opportunity. Thank lots, you. lots of people are going to hear Hear this and find it helpful so uh we, we can't thank you enough well this has been another episode of the curbsiders bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole yummy great still hungry for more join our patreon and get all of our episodes ad free plus twice monthly bonus episodes at patreon.com slash curbsiders you can find show notes at the curbsiders.com and while you're there sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox including our curbsiders digest which recaps the latest practice changing articles guidelines and news in internal medicine and we're committed to high value practice changing knowledge and we want your feedback so please subscribe rate and review the show on youtube spotify apple Podcasts. you can send an email to ask curbsiders at gmail.com reminder that this and most episodes are available for cme through vcu health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org wanted to give a special thanks to our producer for this episode dr beth garbs garbatelli and to our whole curbsiders team our technical production is done by pod paste elizabeth proto runs our social media. Chris the Chew Man Chew is the moderator for our Discord and Stuart Brigham composed our theme music and with all that, until next time Paul I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And Matt as always, our main Dr. Paul Nelson Williams thank you and goodbye. Yes.